in antitrust law is triple damages. That is to say, this differential between a market price for a wage and the amount you were actually paid is triple to determine your damage. All right? So the NFL was liable for a huge payment to the players for implementing their uh, restrictions on player mobility. So that was part of what was going to be decided. And the second part of what was going to be decided was the judge, as is normal in antitrust case, was going to impose rules on the league. And of course, that is kind of a weird thing, to have some judge decide to make up the rules for labor market. And needless to say, both players and owners are not too happy about the prospect that some judge sitting in some court in Minnesota is going to write down the rules for how teams and players interact in the labor market. So prior to, just, just before the relief phase of litigation was to happen, the NFL and the players settled. Now one of the intriguing facts of life, the collective bargaining agreements that have existed in professional football since 1992 are not collective bargaining agreements. Their settlement of an antitrust suit. Part of the settlement of the antitrust suit was that the players agreed to reform a union because management wanted them to in order to get the antitrust immunity for other features of what was going on in the NFL, such as the draft, uh, such as revenue sharing among teams, they didn't want to be liable under antitrust law uh, for those activities, so they said, please reform as a union. And in return, we promise you that if you ever decide that if the collective bargaining agreement in the, as a settlement of an antitrust case ever ends, and you decide to decertify again, we won't challenge it. Now, I bet you haven't read that in the newspaper about what's going on in Minnesota. But that's actually what the lawsuit is about. Is the NFL actually bound by that commitment in the prior settlement of an antitrust case not to challenge the decertification of the union when it happens again after the expiration of a collective bargaining agreement? That's what the case is actually about. The, the union contends we have a contract. Uh, we don't have to form a union if we don't want one. It's up to employers to decide, employees to decide whether they want to be represented by a union or they want to have their salaries determined in the free market. Um, it's the position of the NFL that we need a union. Please form a union. Because we can't survive as a league unless we have an immunity, a union that gives us an antitrust immunity. And because you formed a union last time, it must be a sham that you on decertify the union now, just for the purpose of getting a better agreement in the next collective bargaining agreement. And so the courts ought to hold that even though you've decertified the union, it doesn't count. This is still a labor dispute and still free of scrutiny from antitrust law. That's what that suit is about. How it will eventually come out would seem to be a no-brainer in the sense that uh, history does say the law is on the side of the players in the sense that, that the National Labor Relations Act and other labor statutes do not impose an obligation on employees to form a union. Stanford professors are not obliged to form a union just because Stanford wants them to have one so it can be immune from the antitrust law. All right? So there isn't any historical precedent for having to form a union when you don't want one. But there's a, there's a problem here. Right? And the problem is, this is unprecedented. As you can say, there's something sort of otherworldly about the sentence I er, uttered three or four sentences ago. We have an industry in which labor doesn't want to be unionized, but management insists that they be unionized. That has never happened before in history, and there is no case precedent for this. That's why it's something of a random variable what the outcome of all this will be. I might add that the NFL is not the only one. Prior to the end of the season, 
The NBA Players Association, the National Basketball Players Association, also had a vote to decertify because their collective bargaining agreement ex uh, expires at the end of the playoffs this year. We could, be play we could play through exactly the same series of events this summer with basketball as we're now going through in football. And it's exactly the same issue. The league wants a union because they want an antitrust exemption for various activities having to do with labor. The players don't want a union anymore because they think they can do better in a free market. Um, how this will play out basically is unknown because of the lack of precedent. There is lots of precedent, precedent that management can violate the antitrust laws in the player market. There is no precedent with respect to do, do players have an obligation to form a union. As I said before, I think this is part of a great transition because if it's true that more likely than not, when all the dust settles two years from now, it will be decided that you can't force people to form a union when they don't want to. If that decision comes out that way, then looking in the three to five year time horizon, it is extremely likely there will be no more players union. And the reason there will be no more players union is because players have become convinced over the last 20 years that there is no need for a union, that they are better off without one. They are better off forsaking the ability to strike and forsaking the ability to engage in collective bargaining for things like dispute resolution, minimum salaries, health care, fringe benefits, that they're better off giving that up than they are uh, retaining it, that they get a, they'll get a better deal out of an unfettered market than they will in a bilateral collective bargaining relationship. And the reason this is true, which economists have been telling them incidentally for 40 years, economists first started telling players associations that they shouldn't form unions in the, in the early 1970s. And the reason they shouldn't form unions is basically the following. Unions work most effectively <coughs> when the labor force is relatively homogeneous. When, when the workers are basically interchangeable. Where it makes sense to say, if you work on this slot on the assembly line, if you're the one uh, attaching the defenders to the main body of the automobile, you're paid X dollars an hour. That makes no sense at all for a football team because of the, of the individual variability in productivity uh, uh, within, within the job. Players are not interchangeable. Every single player negotiates an individual contract under the umbrella of a, pre, of, a, of, a pro, of a series of labor market rules imposed by the league or imposed by collective bargaining. So unions themselves have very little to much. They can't do what unions normally do, which is negotiate what wages will be. Instead, what they end up doing is negotiating rules for the labor market. And in particular, what they always do at the end of the day is get extra goodies for the existing set of veterans at the expense of the new players who will be coming along in the future. What the NFL tried to do to get agreement this time was to say, we want to reduce the total salary bill paid to players, but the way we're going to do it is we're going to put a very harsh cap on salaries of rookies so that new draft choices will not be paid very much, no matter how good they are. And so the, the take back that we're going to get will come primarily from these players in the first four years of their career. From the standpoint of veterans, you'll be, in, you'll be gold, because the reduction in the total amount available in the underneath the salary cap will be offset by the reduction in salaries paid to people in the first four years of their career. This time, for the first time in history, the union didn't bite for that. Historically, they've always bitten for something that says, let's give more money to the veterans at the expense of the rookies. This time, they didn't do it. And most likely, all the players' associations are in the same boat. That they finally have committed themselves to a marketplace for labor as opposed to unions. Now, whether this works depends on the outcome of the litigation, both the NFL litigation now and the NBA litigation that's to come three or four months from now. But if it's true that the law is on the side of the players on the simple proposition you don't have to form a union if you don't want one, 
then the future is very different than the future we have now. Um, first of all, it's almost certain that a salary cap that is binding on all or nearly all teams <coughs> would not pass antitrust scrutiny. In other words, you can imagine a salary cap passing scrutiny if it only applied to the best teams. Suppose you had a rule, the salary cap is last year's average payroll for all teams in the league plus 20%. All right? That would say most teams have enough room to spend more money next year than they did this year. But the very top teams, the teams that have the best teams and the highest payroll, they won't have any room to, to expand. All right? So you could achieve guaranteeing yourself against a very wealthy, irrational owner acquiring a huge group of players uh, to dominate the league. You could insure yourself against that without having a salary cap that applied to everybody. Likewise, individual player caps, like in the NBA, the, the, the rule that caused LeBron James and Dwayne Wade to be on the same team, which is given we can't make any more money than the individual cap, we might as well be on the same team and try to win a championship, that would almost certainly, again, be an antitrust violation. So, in the new regime that will come about in the future, uh, things like the draft are very much up in the air. They may never exist again after three or four years from now. Things like ubiquitous salary caps are very much up in the air and may not exist several years from now. Uh, and the degree of free agency, beginning with college graduates who are just beginning their career, uh, that you know, sort of ubiquitous free agency system may be all across all sports in a few years. That will fundamentally change the business model of how a professional sports team is run, and it will change the model of how a league is run. And uh, you, you can be assured that if you could believe economics research, of course, we don't have any real world data about what a league would look like under these conditions because no league has ever operated under these conditions. But the research that we have done thus far on the expansion of free agency says, from the standpoint of the fan, if anything, it's better to have more free agency. And why is it better? In the current system, with restrictions as they are on these players in the first four years of their career, it's extremely hard to get out from a deep hole if you have a bad team. You think about the condition of the 49ers. Uh, it would be a lot easier for Jim Harbaugh if he could go out and hire half of the people who were drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. Uh, it's a team that's deep in the hole, that has problems at every position, but it has a very limited ability in the short run to improve itself by getting new players. Similarly, if we think about the LeBron James, Dwayne Wade circumstance, if Miami had to pay twice as much for LeBron James as they ended up paying because of the individual salary cap, they would be less likely to also have Dwayne Wade because then their salary bill would be so high they couldn't possibly afford it given their revenue. Okay, so the world we're going to be into, I think, is one of much greater competition, of much greater volatility in one-loss records for given teams through time as the very best teams lose more players and the very worst teams are able to improve themselves more rapidly. But in any case, it's going to be an interesting ride. Uh, and you may have the wonderful joy in the next two or three years, uh, if this case goes the other way, having a lockout in every single sport simultaneously. <laughs> well, you know, there are certain limitations. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.